All right, so today we're going to talk about the clay construction aspect of a project. And we're going to go over the tools that we're going to use and uh, talk a little bit about the construction methods that we're going to use in some vocab type terms. So clays are materials that we're going to use. We've got a wear board that we're going to work on your tables with so that way the clay can kind of stay contained within this and you don't get clay all over the tables. It's called a wear board because clay in its various states is a different type of wear. You have green wear, uh, which is what we're working with now where it's still uh, soft. We have bisque wear, which is after it's fired, and then we have a glaze wear, which we don't necessarily use because we're painting these. Uh, and we have uh, plastic clay is the softest, which is what this is now. And we have bone dry, which is when all of the moisture has evaporated out of it, like this little bit that's here, um, and it's ready to be fired. Okay. So uh, tools that we're going to use. We have a knife that we call a fettling knife. Uh, it isn't sharp, okay, but it does have a uh, cut side and a not cut side. All right, clay is relatively soft, so either side will work, but one side works significantly easier. And this side will work, but you've got to push on it a little bit harder. Okay. We have various different types of wire loop tools, and it's called a wire loop tool because it's a piece of wire, and it's in the shape of a loop. Go figure. All right. And what these do is when we have clay that's really thick, like if with your project, if you're making you know, like an apple or something like that that's got a lot of mass to it, it needs to be hollow. Okay, because this, to fire it, I would have to let this sit for probably two months before it would, all the moisture would evaporate out of it to where I can put it in the kiln. Okay, so we take the wire loop tool, we go down inside of it, and we dig this inside away. Okay, and what this does is it makes this thinner, so that way it will dry a little bit easier. And it exposes the interior surface to the air, so that way it will dry from the inside as well as the outside. Okay because we fire to cone 04, which is 1940 degrees. So if you have moisture that's still left in here, that moisture is going to turn into a vapor when it gets up to that temperature. And when that does that, when the liquid turns to a vapor, it expands. So that means that it has to expand someplace and then your clay is going to pop, okay? Uh, I have been next to the kiln when products have popped, when that has happened, it's not a good sound and generally the projects that are around it, uh, they get damaged as well. So not only are you out of project, but your classmates may be out of project as well. And that's never good. All right. So and the other way thing that we need to be cautious of when we do this is if we need to make something to where it still has a base, uh, like with an apple, to where it's going to be hollow, but you can't just leave it sitting open on the bottom. And you take a piece of clay and you attach it onto the bottom and you get this all connected. Okay. We have just created a giant air pocket, all right? And if you have that connected all the way around, same thing happens. That air heats up, it needs to go someplace, so it's going to expand. So when this expands, that's going to pop off, okay? So all we need to do is to take a tool like this here, or like a, with a needle tool, something thinner, poke a hole in it on the very bottom or someplace out of the way, and just that little hole that's there is enough for the air or for, to uh, expand out of. It doesn't need to be very big, it uh, just needs to be enough for the air to move around. That will save your project. All right. So we'll set that aside. <clears throat> now we've got various different uh, shaping tools. We've got some wooden tools uh, to use to shape things. Uh, some of them that they have different tips like this one here is more for doing more dots or for smoothing stuff out to make lines. The other end of it is more flat to get in smooth stuff out or to create shapes like this. But if you've got to use this to create a lot of small little indentations, it would be a lot easier to use a fork because using a fork will do that same thing, but it will just do four of them at a time. So like the, the pieces of cake that we looked at yesterday, uh, use this to create the texture on the side of it. You also use this when you go to slip and score and you can use a knife for that as well. And what slipping and scoring is, is we take a piece of clay and say, I need to add you know, a stem or I need to add another chunk of clay onto it for some item that's going on there. We can't just stick it on there and smooth it out, especially if we've gone from one day to the next. So when we do this, because this clay will have uh, one moisture content and the new piece of clay that we're adding onto it will have a different moisture content. So we take our fork, we take our knife, and we're going to score the clay where it's going to attach. Depending on how big of a surface you're going to attach, it may be big enough for the fork, 
it may be small enough that you have to use a knife and do something real tiny like that. Take a little dab. So what that's doing is it's taking your clay surface that's real smooth and you're creating surface area like this. And you take do the same thing on the other side. So you have two rough surfaces. Put a little dab of slip on there. Slip is a liquid clay. It kind of acts as a glue. And you push those two sides together and that makes a stronger connection like this. Okay? And what that slip also does is it helps to equalize the moisture content from one side of the clay to the other because one side may be a little stiffer. All right, so I've already got uh, two halves of my, or two halves, two sections of my project done. So I'm going to take this piece of clay here and I'm going to stretch it out to get to the shape that it needs to. That now, to it is a brat. Oh, okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set that aside so that way I can kind of get the same thickness. Now before I'll give you a piece of clay, you need to have a drawing. So you need to have a drawing that has your a front view, a side view, and some dimensions as far as how big it's going to be. So that way uh, we kind of figure out what it's going to look like. So that way I will give you a proper size uh, hunk of clay. Now, the best tool that you have at your disposal, you have 10 of them. And they're your fingers, okay? Because your fingers will smooth out the clay way easier than a tool will just because your finger is a little bit softer and it will uh, run through those edges and smooth them out a lot easier. Uh, if the clay is really, really wet, then it will have a harder time to get it to smooth out. So you may have to let it stiffen up a little bit. <coughs> so you get this, it is about the same size, kind of tap that down. Now the other tool that we have that it's not out right now is a slab roller. And what that slab roller does, if you have uh, something that you need to make a bottom for, like a piece of pie or a pizza or something of that nature, then we can use the slab roller to get out a nice flat section. Uh, so that way it will um, give you a nice even consistent base to work with. Now, I want this to be a little bit rounded so that way it will fit the shape of it because ultimately I want to be able to remove this. So I've got this side scored already. Make sure that this works size wise. We need to take a little bit off. Now, what we're doing is a type of uh, sculpture that is called additive sculpture, where we are adding clay uh, onto itself to make what it is that we're doing. There's two things. We have additive sculpture and we have subtractive sculpture. Uh, subtractive sculpture would be if I had this chunk of clay and I was just carving away, carving away, carving away, and then whatever I ended up with would be my project. Okay? So the more, a lot of the famous pieces that we know of, like the uh, Venus de Milo or Michelangelo's David, those are what are considered a subtractive method because you start out with a big chunk of marble and you just chisel away at it. All right, so this is roughly about the size and shape that I need it to be. So because this clay is the same moisture content, uh, I can go ahead and just connect these together. If I were to be making part of this today and then making part of it uh, next week or the next day, then I would want to slip and score it because I'm working with this today. I can just connect everything together because, because this is uh, a removable center section. I can come on the inside and I can use the back side of my finger or I can do what we call a replacement coil. So replacement coil is just a real small coil that will go into an area to help add a little bit of structure. Okay, And we're just going to take this, lay this down in that little groove, press that down, and just take this and smooth this in. So that way that will help connect that, make it nice and smooth, and will give me a lot more a stronger connection. All right, so there's a lot left to do with this as far as um, fiddling with it to get it into the shape that it needs to be, moving clay around, but I'm not going to sit and do that for right now. So this will fit in here. Now, because I took a wire loop tool and I carved the, the bite marks out of the end of this, uh, I need to do kind of the same thing with the bun 
So once I get this situated as far as the size of it goes, which I might make it a little bit shorter, uh, I'll do the same thing across the surface of the bun as well. So they're bite marks. So, and there's a little bit more to do, but that's it for now. Alrighty. So questions?